Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It is that time again. It is 5-5, five, five, and you know what that means. Maybe this is the day we launch The Pulse Chain at 5.55, maybe during the uh, the lunar eclipse at uh, about high noon today. Folks, welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt, and this is a special time. We took a week off last week, but Steve Staggs is back, and it is Stephen Friday. And it's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to Steve. And you know what? This week has been really the last two weeks with Steve and with Jesus has been unbelievable. Just some breakthrough things for me. And I, the whole point of this whole thing that we're doing, this idea of right side up is I've been talking to Steve, right? For six months or so. And it's like, man, Steve, this is too good. <laughs> this is too good. We need to share this with everybody else. And so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here. You're you're coming in on our conversation. This is not, you know, I think we're probably a little bit more prepared today just to talk about a topic, but this isn't like, you know, structured and giving a sermon. This is two dudes who love the Lord going, how do we, how do we make sense of all of this stuff? And what's amazing about Steve is that, you know, for the last 30, 40 years, he's been pursuing like a professional, right? Listening to the father speak. And to me, it is such an encouragement to me. And it's, it's a blessing. And it's been a blessing to so many people who have watched. So I want to welcome you back to this. This is going to be really, really good because I hope that I can, I hope that I can articulate. And I know Steve can articulate the, this concept that we're going to talk about today, but I want you to, I want you to experience what I experienced over this last week is a, is a bit of a revelation and breakthrough because it makes things so like the evidence of it is it makes it so simple, right? To understand it, it's it's it, in its simplicity because it is simple, right? Even a child can understand it. And folks, sometimes I feel like a baby. So welcome back to the pulse. We're gonna bring him in. Let's say hello to you. We got some new folks in the chat today, and I'm excited about who's here. Michael, what's going on? Good morning, Matt. Welcome back, Steve. We missed you. That's so nice. You guys are awesome. Uh, though it tarries, wait for it. There you go. My online ghost. What's good, everyone? Sam Kemp. Good morning, Florida mystery man. Yes, Michael is here. And then kinetics kinetics. It's so good to see you. You know, Steve doesn't know this, but you are an OG hexagon. You are one of the greats and just so glad that you're here. Thanks for stopping in and saying hello. Hope this is a blessing to you folks. We're going to be talking about stuff that, um, is really core and central to like life. And uh, I just love listening and talking and questioning and asking questions and learning um, with Steve, because really that's what it is, right? He's not, he's like, let's do this together with Jesus himself. Bearded Saint, thanks for being here. Welcome back again. Uh, let's see who else. David Lee, David Lee. It cannot be a stream without David Lee showing the love for folks. I don't know if you guys know, but David Lee came to my dad's funeral, traveled seven and a half hours from uh, southwestern Indiana. It's good to see you. Here we go. Here we go. Um, DJ and Dougie Peach, what's up, dude? We, we you run the gamut of streams, man. I saw you on Thoth's Child last night. That was a train wreck, but it's good to see you here. We're going to promise this not being a train wreck tonight. Uh, Hexonium, good to see you. Drix is here. What's up, Drix? Nico, um, hey Matt, how are things? The streams are great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and Kinetics, my pleasure. Thanks for the kind words. This is going to be a good one. And then Hex Monkey, I haven't seen you. I thought about you last night. I was like, I wonder how Hex Monkey's doing. I haven't heard from him in a while. And here he is. Uh, and Hexonium's here. All right, let's bring Steve in and just uh, let's uh, let's have a good conversation. Steve, what's up, man? Hey, good morning. This how is episode you? episode seven, by the way. Yes, very good. Seven. Yeah. So this will make fourteen hours of content. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic mouse. yeah it's wonderful though but we could just it's funny you know we joke when i call you on the uh the telephone uh, that you know do we need to carve out three hours and it's just <laughs> such a joy and i just i just sense in you that you have just it's like your favorite topic you just love talking about jesus and love talking about you know what he shared with you and encouraging people to connect with them, them themselves which I, yeah. I appreciate so much. How are you doing today? Anything going on with you? No, we're doing we're doing well, thank you. We we're coming to the end of uh, the school year with the grandkids, so we got a lot of you know festivities that we're going to attend and having fun. My granddaughter is playing volleyball for the first time, and so awesome. she's learning what it's like for a ball to travel 
you know, through space and then end up landing on her head occasionally. So yeah, yeah. So she's she's going into a whole new whole new experience. So that's a lot of fun to watch. So a good time of the year. That's fantastic. Yeah, we've got the same thing with teenagers and all the things that are going on. This is like the craziest time because we're in the last month of the the school year. But it's also the the feeling of spring and yeah. the seasons are really unique because it 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 is a reminder to you, right? And there's the creation in this this idea of renewal and springtime. Any thoughts that you have on that as far as the cycles of life, like literally a springtime, because it seems like there are these, you know, there are these cycles to life. How do you see that when it comes to just your perspective on just engaging with God? It seems like there are chapters or seasons or cycles. No, that's that's a great question, Matt. The, um, you know, the Apostle Paul talks in um, in Romans one about uh, about the self evidence of the creation and how it speaks to God and about God. It points to Him, and it is you know the English word or word phrase we use is self evident. And so what I find personally is the, the, entire, the entirety of the, of the creation is to be observed for its marvel. And when you just take time to, to look at it and observe it, God is just speaking in volumes through everything he does from the, from the portraits he paints in the sky for us every morning and every evening to you know, springtime, this, you know, coming into the fullness of life and what life looks like, yep. you know, and by the way, not a one of us created this, right? Not one of us designed it, right? Not a one of us really know how it even works. And yet it does. And so it's kind of that reminder that says, listen, I, I have put everything in its season, in its time, in its place to accomplish the purpose for which I have created it. And it will do exactly what I have created it to do. Wow. Everything. You know, now, it's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. No, so, so the point of that is now you, now you look at the things that would come against you. You can see the things that are for you, you know, in the creation, in the seasons that you're talking about in the times and cycles of life, you can see them in the context of being for you. But the moment they become against you, now you wonder, huh, God, have you really got this thing covered? And it's like, well, no. If I have, if I got it covered when it's for you, why, why would you think that I don't have it covered when you think it is against you? Yeah. Hey, no, there is nothing here. See, that is not for you if you learn to look at it in the way that it needs to be seen. Mm. And so when I look at, you know, I, I always talk about it in the mornings, you know, I have my, my morning coffee. That's my time to smell the, smell the roses. Just take time to appreciate what God has created and just, just enjoy it with him. Yeah. So that, that's what it does for me. That's fantastic. Well, you know, one of the things I think, commonly, especially young people that are glued to screens. You know, I've got a 12 year old who is glued. He, we got to peel him off of that thing, but we moved into an area where there's a lot of wildlife yeah. and we're right next to a Creek and there's a giant herd of deer there. I mean, there's thousands mm -hmm. of deer. And of course this is the season now where, you know, all of these does are going to have offspring. And, you know, I, I watch them walk go by every morning. I see lots of deer and of course birds and all kinds of things. It's like a wildlife preserve. But when you see, see this, you know, we've seen it a cycle from last year where all these, you know, um, fawns are born and it's amazing to see, you know, that cycle and everything. And you can kind of see it's, it's, you know, the springtime, but you see it in the deer pregnant with possibility yeah. and that, that reproduction. And, and when you said, you know, we didn't create any of this stuff, Sometimes we have to get outside of these man-made things because we're in kind of this concrete jungle and looking at these things. But what you're saying, I think, is the heavens declare, right? Yeah. All of creation is declaring yeah. and it's, it's communicating. It's, um, 
one, it's beauty and complexity, right? And, you know, we see that in, in so many different ways. And I think there are people in certain professions, like I've got a buddy who's a, he's a trauma surgeon and he's like, I see, I see God all the time. Yeah. He's like, I see it in, in how amazing the plumbing of the body is, yeah. you know, how he can just basically take things out and resew them up and they just work. But then also the miracles of people coming and praying for people and just being near them and just seeing miracles. He's like, I, the things I get to see. And I'm like, that's really, really cool. And so that's a great place to start. I, I appreciate that a ton. Yeah. So I want to, I want to dive back into this. This is kind of, we'll talk about the topic and then we'll see where it goes. Okay. Cause I've, I've just been literally going excited as all get out to have this conversation with you. Cause I had an aha moment that I would love for other people to have as well. And maybe some people just got this and crypto harpy just slow. And that's very possible too. But let's talk about this about, let's go back to the garden and let's talk about the transaction. Okay. And so the term that you've been using and we've been talking about, and I literally grasped this last week in its fullness, is this idea of offers and transactions as it relates to what I think in church language we would call sin. Right. And so I want to, I want to, we're going to be talking about sin today, but we're going to talk about it in a way I've never processed it before. And that was the big ha ha for me. And this is the idea of transaction and offer. Can you give us some context of that as it relates to the garden? Because I think that's that beginning of authority shift, giving it away, transactions and such. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in, in, we've talked about this before, but in sports, there's this concept that you of fundamentals, that you're only as good as your fundamentals. And so poor fundamentals can dramatically compromise somebody with spectacular talent, yeah. while solid fundamentals can amplify the skills of somebody who just has an average skill set. And so you, you see that all the time in sports. That's what's so amazing about sports is you can actually see these things that we talk about in real time just by turning on your TV and watching a basketball game, a baseball game, a football game, you know, a tennis match, whatever. Um, Larry Bird, fantastic um, example in basketball. I mean, we could probably run faster than, Le than Larry Bird up and down the court. And I'm 72 tomorrow and, and you're 50. So, you know, Larry did not have blazing speed. When you watched him play and walk around, he didn't even look like he was all that coordinated. But he had spectacular fundamentals that took the skills that he had and so magnified them that he became one of the greatest, probably one of the greatest top 10 players ever to play. Now, not only was he one in a million of the general population, but then of the population of professional basketball players, the best of the best in the world that have ever lived, He's probably in the top 10%. Well, my, my reason for, for starting my answer there is to, to emphasize the importance of fundamentals. And we just don't know what our fundamentals are when it comes to the kingdom of God. We do not have a clue. And I'm speaking, you know, very personally on that. You know, I mean, I was a guy that studied... 30, 40 hours a week for years to try to come to understand what the Bible was talking about and, you know, what it meant and, you know, how I was to apply it and what insights it was to give me. And Matt, I'm not sure that I can point to one thing that I learned in my study that Jesus left intact. <laughs> he stripped every single bit of, bit of it away and said, okay, now that you've been introduced it into something that's bigger than you, let's get rid of the junk that's telling you what that bigger is. Yeah. 
And now let me start telling you about it. Well, can I, can I just say this? I think there are a lot of people watching Steve and that will watch this who are, that find themselves in that position. Yeah. You know, they, they literally are looking at things going, something ain't right here. And yeah. I feel like these things are not syncing up. And I've been frustrated by not only, you know, kind of the organized side of Christianity, but, you know, these things that, that don't seem to be congruent with the things that I, I sense are true. And so anyway, I just want to say that I think this is very relevant to people watching. Well, and I think it's what, um, to my observation, recognizing in you what, is, what I myself experienced is that when, when Jesus introduces it to you, it like rocks you to the core and like, duh, how did I not right, see right. that? How exactly. did I not know that that was true? Because it is so amazingly simple. Yeah. It, it is so amazingly simple. It's like, wow, how did, how did that escape me? Well, Steve, the reason it escaped you is because I never intended for you to try to figure it out on your own. Wow. You do not have the mental horsepower to do it. It is an invitation for you to then learn with me and from me about what my father had in mind when he decided to create. Steve, are you interested in that? Man, am I ever. Let's do that, right? And so this is kind of a little bit of a, of a setup to, to answer your question about transactions, that this is all part of the very basic fundamentals of how God designed the creation to function. And for those who are who are a part of the Christian community in, in particular, and especially those who participate on a regular basis in, you know, in the, ch in the church and the activity of the church, they are very familiar with what uh, a term called the plan of God. But the plan that we're told about is not the plan of God. It has absolutely nothing to do with his plan. And that, that concept literally, literally rocked me to my core because it was, for me, fundamental. Yeah. But it wasn't his fundamentals. It was the fundamentals that I was taught from another philosophy or point of view. Now here, now for those who are in, in business, we can back out in particular and say, well, what's a plan? We devise plans all the time. Well, the plan is not the objective. The plans is the means for accomplishing an objective. Okay. Nobody devotes themselves to the plan. They devote themselves to what the plan is designed to achieve. And so the same thing with God. So what, the plan is always a part of something that's bigger than it. So what is the bigger that the plan of God is about that incorporates this concept of transaction? Well, that's the starting point for virtually everything. So okay. let me say, let me say that back to you just so I, I might get it right. It sounds like what you're saying is, Plans are the result of and the execution of the vision or purpose. The means that, by accomplishing. So the means by which accomplishing. So so much of the time, I feel like we are creating because the tools are laying around and there's no purpose and there's no, there's no overarching vision and there's no destination. But it's like, well, I happen to have a hammer, so let's hit something. Yeah. And I almost feel like a lot of this is, well, granddaddy was a Quaker. I need to be taught how to do it like they did it. And it's in a way we, the traditions drive a lot of the activity without the understanding of its origin or purpose. And I feel like you're going to the core to say, well, a plan is to execute. No, no, no. Well, what's the purpose? Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. That's very fair. It's, it's to see that the plan is a part of something bigger than itself. Okay. 
And it is simply the articulation of the means by which that bigger is to be accomplished. So God is a pretty big guy. He thinks pretty big, you know, talking earlier about, you know, t t the seasons of the year and what we do in the morning. We go out and we look at the at the sunset. My wife loves sunsets yeah. and sunrises. She just they just so feed and soothe her soul. She looks for them every morning. Well, guess what's happening? That is bigger than her. Yeah. And the one who created and made it to be is bigger than her. Well, she can look at it and just get excited about the sunset, or she can then take the next step and say, wow, God, why did you, why did you do that? What did you have in mind for when you created that sunset or that sunrise? I don't know what you had in mind, but man, I'll tell you what, it so soothes and feeds my soul. Thank you for that. See, now we're in a deep, deep relationship dynamic yeah. that introduces and opens the door to something bigger. Do you think this brings up a big question? You know, my wife loves the sunsets and the sunrises too, right? And I think that there are different personalities. Like you and I are extremely curious, right? I, I am, and we're also very abstract in our thinking, yeah. right? And so when I look at different people that I know, there's some people who are like, stop talking so philosophically, guys. You know, let's get down to business. This is about facts and information. And for me, this is just a joy because I want to examine the edges of all of this. And so when you say you look at the sunset and you're like, Why'd you make that? I'm you got me. I'm interested. Like I want to know, but not everybody is there. Not everybody is really that curious. And and some people are just like, you know, sunset schmunch set. Let's get to work. You guys get. You guys are like wasting my time. Yeah. How do you? How, and they're real. Like I know a lot of those people. Yeah. They're like you're wasting my time with this silliness. We got work yeah. to do. How do you square that? Oh. Well, actually, I don't try to square it. Okay, fair enough. That, that That is, that's how they're wired. Yeah. Now, if you want to get into a pure sterile fact exchange, then okay, let's get into the facts. Yeah. Okay. Are you a lawless person or are you a lawful person? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lawful person. Great. How about the people around you? If you put a hundred of them around you and said, hey, how many of you folks are lawless? How many of them were, would raise their hand? Zero. Okay, zero. They're lying to you. Well, 98% of them probably believe they are absolutely law-abiding lawful people. Yeah. But the other two who aren't don't want you to know about it. <laughs> so nobody's going to raise their hand. So if right. you're okay, so okay, now facts and figures. So if if 98 out of 100 people believe that they're, they're lawful, law-abiding people, then why are we surrounded with lawlessness? Amen. Amen. Tell me, why is that? Yep. If you were to go down the street and ask every single person, are you an intentionally law lawless person? Or would you consider yourself generally law-abiding? You would be asking that question for weeks, months, and years and be lucky to get across a couple who would say, who admit to you that they're lawless. Yeah. If that's the case, then why are we surrounded by lawlessness? We are drowning in it. Yep. Why? Ooh, what a setup, man. What a yeah. setup. See? So if you don't know the answer to that, then maybe we ought to take a little time, be just a bit philosophical to yeah. see if we can get to the bottom line of, okay, the why to what is happening. Okay. In my world of problem solving, you can't you can't solve a symptom. You have to solve a source. Yeah. Well, I got to dig a little bit to find out what the source is. Okay. And sin to our opening discussion that you that you pointed to is is a part of that. You know what is sin and why is sin? What does that actually look like? So in this bigger, you know, in this bigger world that, that God is involved in, that he invites us into, the plan for which Jesus is executing and the vision for which he is, he is set out to accomplishing 
and that he works on virtually every second of every day speaking in the context of time, then gee whiz, I, I'd like to know what that is. What is it that you are actually building toward? What is the plan that, the, that has actually been devised to accomplish the bigger of the plan? And oh, by the way, what is that bigger? So that, that to me is where I'm just articulating the process that Jesus took me through as he began to unwind all of what I thought was true and started to replace what is true. And so I'm going to share that with you. Please do. And, Please and, do. That's why, and that's why I share it with folks, because my hope is not to tell you what's going on, but to have what I am telling you inspire you to go to the guy who knows and get your own treasure. Amen to that. And and for those of you who are new to this, and if you're coming in on, you know, you know, episode seven, and there's been six more prior, I just want to say the reason, the reason I'm doing this, and why I'm so excited about is every conversation I've ever had with Steve, and the, the private conversations and the public ones, every time I've ever questioned anything or asked anything, he said to me, why don't you ask him yourself? And I think the underlying thing for me that I keep repeating to myself and I, everyone I talk to about anything related to, to God or Jesus is I say, Jesus is not a historical figure. He is alive and he speaks. And that to me is like when I boil everything down, that's the constant reminder to me. And that's where so much hope is derived from. And so I just want folks that if you're new and you're walking into this thing, the main thing that Steve always says to me is, Hey, by the way, why don't you ask him yourself? And I, I really so appreciate that. And of course, that's a theme of all this. But I wanted to kind of remind everyone that's the whole thing here. Not to give away the punchline, but Jesus is alive and he speaks. He's not just some historical figure. And so keep going, Steve. I just wanted to make sure that was clear at the front. Sure. My pleasure. Um, so. Now, this, now let's get to the transaction. So where, where does this concept of transaction fit? And so in, in the construct of how, uh, how God created things, well, it begins with an understanding of what the Father's vision was for creating. Why did the Father decide to create? So we're speaking of the Father as the first, the beginning, the one who, who existed prior to anything being created, okay? So the first. Um, language is real difficult to, to try to convey that idea and concept. We, we attach the word God to it. Jesus called him the God and Father. Jesus described him as the one who is greater than all. Jesus is the one who said, out of the Father I came from. So this idea that it's somewhat of a misnomer of creation, that things are created out of nothing. No, they're created, they are, they are resident within him, and so they come out of him and they take on a material form. So what, is, what was the reason you decided to create, Father? What was, what was it? Now, nobody ever told me this. Hundreds, thousands of hours of study and reading and going to sermons and doing, I mean, chasing this stuff like crazy. Nobody ever shared this with me. As a matter of fact, when Jesus first asked me what my father's vision was, I had no, I did not even have a context for understanding the question. What, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean our father's vision? Well, Steve, don't you, don't you talk about the plan of God? Well, yeah, all the time. Well, what do you think the plan of God is? Well, I gave him my two cents worth. He says, nah, you know, no, that, that's not it. 
By the way, he went on to tell me why, but we won't take up time here. Okay, great. But what is a plan a part of? Is a plan the ultimate objective? Well, I had to stop, start to think. I had to transition from the assumptions of the way I thought about things to the reality of the way things are. Well, Steve, a plan is something that is bigger than itself. And he just repeated to me what I've shared with you earlier. So why do you think my father devised a plan and what was that plan designed to accomplish? Matt, I had no answer. Right. Right. Didn't even understand the question. Well, Steve, the reason my father decided to create was to accomplish his vision that his man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Say that again. The father's vision is that his man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Well, and that's when you think about like what, what hits me so hard there is this idea of being a son. Yeah. Yeah. Being, being, you know, one of the things you've said in the past is that we're the only ones in creation who exist in both the physical and the spiritual at the same time. Yeah. And I think about my dog doesn't exist in the spiritual as far as I know. And then I think about the angels too. And all of these things that have been upside down, you know, and I've read these things, you'll, you'll rule over the angels, like all of these ideas that hold on a second, everything in this world seems upside down. And then when I, when you start saying things like, like this, you recognize the fact that, hold on, you were meant to rule. Well, what does that make you if you are a son? Well, you're an heir. And what, what power does the father have? And, and then I keep coming back to things like, without me, you can do nothing, right? I'm the vine and you're the branches. And you've given so many good analogies of where are you drawing this strength from? And it's like, well, if you're separated from me, you can't rule in my nature and character. And so amazing and wonderful and beautiful and simple. Um, but you know what? I can't tell you the last time somebody said, because I think one of the first things you said to me is, we've forgotten who we are. Yeah. We in, know who we in, are. in him, not separate from him, in him. What did he say about us? And what you're saying is, now that I look at it, that I go back and look at it, and then I look at it in the Hebrew and look at the original, it's like, yeah, this is why I made you. Yeah. When you think about that, what's amazing to me is, what does that say about us, Steve? Yeah. Like what? And not to say we have power to exert, but we have power to exert. Yeah. Like, and, and that's the thing that's so amazing. But, you know, and, and I hate to go off on this tangent, but I, I just, this idea of speaking things into existence, you know, it's like we're, we're doing all the same things he did, whether we acknowledge it or not. We, we can't, almost can't help but create like he created. And, so it, and this invitation that you've given to me, which is so life-giving, is why don't you do it with him instead of by yourself? Yeah. Oh, oh that sounds better to me. Hey, let's go to the source. Let's go to the guy who knows and has the vision. So why did you make me? And so many people, Steve, are like, why am I here? And what's the purpose? And I told you that story about those kids I was teaching a crypto class for. And I said, hey, put on the left-hand side of the paper the day you were born. They put their, And I said, put on the right-hand side of the paper the day you'll die. Two out of the five kids is like, yeah, I don't think I'll live past 30. Yeah. I'm like, what? Why? And they're like, well, there's just a lot of people born. And, you know, just somebody will replace me. These are kids at a Christian school. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. And it's like, people think they're an accident and they've been told that they're an accident. And this is a whole different, it's a whole different thing, but it's reinforced by, it's almost like I missed it because it wasn't reinforced and it wasn't reminded. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just kind of like went off on a tangent. Well, no, I mean, the, the audience is seeing what happens in our conversations. Right. There is something that, you know, a thought or a concept that is triggered. Well, why in the world would I want to intrude on you on, on Jesus helping you process something and come to a recognition of what it means in real time for you, regardless if it means anything to me. Yeah. 
See? That, that to me is the room that said, no, no, you, you go ahead and process away. You go ahead and let that happen. Let that processing occur for you. You know what's so great, though, is also there's something I recognize in you, which is maybe the discipline of fundamental leadership, is what you're doing is you're allowing room for that to happen. So many people do not allow room for that to happen. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate it. Sometime we'll talk about the three components of leading that Jesus described to me that were absolutely, again, mind-numbing. You know, it's like episode wow. eight. <laughs> yeah, right. Episode eight. We got our next content. That's fantastic. Well, let's <laughs> let's dig into transaction sin offers. I've got some things I want to. I want to talk about as well, but I want, I want you to establish this concept of transaction and you've, you've laid the foundation here. Yeah. We've taken about 30 minutes to just set the, set the foundation. So you think about this, the father's vision is that his man would rule with him. Well, what are the, what are necessary, what are the com necessary components to ruling? Well, when you start thinking about that, this thing just starts exploring. Any, anyone in the audience can do exactly the same thing. Sit down with your piece of paper on your computer, whatever, and say, okay, Jesus, what are the components of ruling? Well, what you'll find is that one of the essential components of ruling is choice. If you cannot exercise a choice, you can't rule. Wow. Okay. What's another component of ruling? You have to be able to distinguish or discern between options. Okay. Oh, that's why we have good and evil. Ah, you can eat of this tree. You can't eat of that tree. What are you doing? You're now ex learning to exercise choice. You're now learning how to decide how you're going to exercise that choice. Are you going to exercise that choice with me? Or are you going to exercise that choice on your own? You see, all of a sudden, these concepts and ideas of ruling that are rooted in the very vision of God now start to take shape, and he starts providing, you know, a framework for us to learn how to play his game. Okay. How does authority fit into that? So you're given this choice, but you're also having the authority to rule. So it's yeah. almost like inherent in the nature of ruling is that you have the authority to rule. Now you've made that choice yes. or you can make that choice. Is that my hitting it right? Yes. Authority is authority is the grant. Okay. Okay. Ruling is the activity. Very good. But that's super helpful. Yeah. And then power is the enabling component of it. Okay. And so all of these pieces start, start fitting together. So now we get into the place. So what is happening is, is that we are now starting to walk into the reality of the father's vision that we, we would rule with him. Well, what is it that we're to rule? His creation. Well, what is his comp creation comprised of? A heavenly dimension and an earthly dimension, a spiritual dimension and a material dimension. So we're to rule over the entirety of his creation with him. Well, how are we then to exercise that rule with him in the fullness of his nature and character, in the fullness of the truth that is him? See, we've been told, by the way, that truth is essentially synonymous with, um, with facts. But truth has nothing to do with facts um, as we relate to facts. Truth is a character quality. And the character quality of, of truth does not distort anything. It has no, no element of corruption in it. That's why Jesus said, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Why? Because there is no corruption in them. He said of his father, your word is truth. So when he speaks, what? Truth. So how are we to rule? We're to rule 
in the fullness of his nature and character in which there is no corruption or decay that would cause it to collapse or be consumed with corruption. Okay. I've lost you here for a second. No, I, I've got to fix my camera. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm just. I'm That's just, right. I was talking with a friend yesterday and that happened and he went bye-bye. So I thought, well, no, we're, you're good. You're good. Keep going. This is good. Okay. Um, so when you look at the father's vision, what it does is he starts describing you to you the entirety of why he created and then how he's going to start preparing his man to accomplish his vision to rule with him. All right. Now, now we've got the, the, the overarching element. Within, within the framework of transaction, there is this thing called offer and acceptance. An offer is made, an acceptance or a rejection is then the response to the offer. By the way, this is only, um, this is how the dynamic works in relationship. Now we've reduced this to a, uh, to a business concept that translates to typically to money or getting something in return. But essentially in relationship, there is an exchange of, of things between parties in relationship. Otherwise there's no relationship, okay? I have no relationship with, you know, people down the street because I have no engagement with them. We don't say hi. We don't, don't we just, there is nothing in that that exists between us. And so this dynamic of transaction is an integral part of relationship, which is to be ruled, which is part of rulership. Okay. So now we're ready to talk about this concept of transaction and the way that you've asked the question. And I hope that was helpful to kind of lay the groundwork for, you oh, know, totally, folks. totally. Okay. So I'm going to begin with this question. Since we're talking about the garden and I've asked it before, so I'll ask it again. If Satan is so powerful, why did he not come into the garden and simply say, folks, I'm taking over? He didn't have that authority. He didn't have the authority. There was nothing that he was, there was no grant of authority, neither authority nor power that he was granted in his creation that would allow him to force man to do anything. And that makes so much sense. You know, the more we, I mean, I feel like we go back to the garden every time we talk. Yes. And it's obviously the origin of this. What's amazing to me is that when you understand that you're ruling not just in the natural, physical, but in the spiritual as well. And I think that's where a lot of people, they don't realize that that's the purpose and plan in his nature and character in both. Right. And th there's evidence of that with this idea that you will rule over the angels. And it also, you know, you think about jealousy. You know, one of the things I don't see like demons walking down the street with pitchforks and horns. No. And one of the things I think is really interesting about this is, well, they do not have the ability to operate in the physical, which on the other hand, I look at the, the grace of God, the protection of us, right? That here we are. If we are an extension of him and made and created in his image and we're conforming to his likeness and is ruling in his nature and character. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Like this is big. Yeah. And, but I think that's one of the things that was a big aha for me was to say that I didn't recognize the fact that these both, both of these things are together because so many people want to say that the spiritual and the, you know, the, where the angels are is far, 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 far away. And what I think is really important is like when you start looking at it and listening this way is to say, no, 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 this is fundamental to the creation. It's both. And someone said one time that you're, it's like you're awake in the dark and asleep in the light. Yeah. And you don't recognize this. And of course, the scriptures talk about this with seeing things dimly. 
And so anyway, I just wanted to say that because it's so big. It's like once you understand that, hold on, his intention for you to rule with him is in his nature and character. Well, it's over both. And no wonder that the serpent who was, you know, that Satan literally came into to get into the physical literally had to um, convince Eve to give over authority. And what an incredible story. Like that makes it like technicolor to me. Well, yeah, it, it is. It is. I mean, you've raised so many, so many issues. Um, for example, if heaven and earth are separated, um, then why did Satan even bother? Right. If if the earth isn't all that, all that it's you know, st- um, all that it's stacked up to be, then why did Satan even even get involved? What what was he even interested in? I mean, he was already walking in the in the throne room of God. What was it about the earth that he appreciated or wanted greater than being in the presence of God's very throne room? That's in- that's incredible. Like that concept itself is incredible. Yeah. So what was it that he saw that we still don't see? Amen. See? Now, so why didn't Satan, if he was so powerful, just come in and say, folks, I'm taking over? By the way, this is a question that Jesus asked me. Why didn't he do it? So I'm going to ask you, you know? Well, what's fascinating about that question that's behind it is if you were to take a thousand people and ask them, who is the superior being, angels or man? They would say angels. They would. They would. You're absolutely right. If you were to ask those same thousand people, who is more powerful, angels or men? They would say angels. If you were then to ask them, who who is more powerful, God or the devil? They would say God. But then if you wrap the whole thing up and said, who do you fear more, the devil or God? They'll say the devil. Wow. Now, who in the world promoted that propaganda? Talk about a marketing campaign. That's the upside down world right there, like at its core. That is it. So if Satan was so powerful, what was it that he, why didn't he just come in and take over? Because he's not as powerful as he's telling us he is. He is only as powerful as what God has assigned him to do. No more, no less. And one of the things he has not assigned him to be able to do is to rule. Wow. He has no authority to rule. Not one ounce. Okay, so then, Steve, how come he's ruling all of this stuff around here? You talked about being drowning in lawlessness. If he doesn't have the authority to rule, then how is he ruling? Ah, now we're getting to the question. Through this mechanism called transaction. Remember what a ruler, one who is vested with the authority to rule, It can decide, it can act, it can decree, it can judge. See, it has authority over. So what did Satan do? He came through the mechanism of transaction. Hey, if I make you an offer and you accept that offer, okay, now we're in business relationships. And so if you accept my offer, then guess what you get in return for what you are giving me in return for your acceptance? Oh, you get all that my offer is entailed. Yeah. All that my, all that my offer is comprised of. We had the conversation about the house, right? Yep. Okay. You make an offer to me to sell your house. Guess what? If I say, okay, and I buy your house, you're done with your house. I get to an, I get the whole kit and caboodle. Yep. See, warts and all. I get it. So through this mechanism of transaction, what, what Satan did is he made an offer to Eve in exchange for something from Eve. Okay. 
Now, what was it that Satan was after? Well, our religious teaching tells us that what Satan was after was to try to get Eve to eat from the tree. No, nah, she could do that all by herself. What was he trying to get her to do? I mean, give him the authority. And how, because... was, he going to, how was that going to happen? She, he was, well, she accepted the lie. She accepted the transaction, but here's yeah. what's behind the transaction, right? I mean, folks, this, see, I even pause because it is still so mind-blowing. What, what the serpent was after was standing. Yeah. See, the serpent had no standing. And we can get into the whole transaction that occurred between Satan and the serpent, and then from the serpent to Eve, and then from Eve to Adam, and then from Adam, you know, on down to all of this posterity. Um, but it all occurred through this mechanism of transaction. See? Now, by the way, that's exactly what was happening with Jesus in the, in the wilderness temptation. Yes. If you are the son of God, then command these stones to be bread. Well, what was behind that? The, the devil was looking for Jesus to grant to him standing. See, as one who hath had the authority to rule. Why? Well, and, and, and so when you say authority to rule, if he had accepted the offer, he is essentially coming up underneath the authority of Satan. Yes. And so yeah. what you're saying then is let's take that, you know, the temptation in the wilderness, had he agreed, he would have given him standing. And then the same thing with Eve in the garden that she actually took the offer. And you yeah. said earlier to me, which I thought was really big. And I think an important point is that when you have a transaction, it all, it starts with an offer, but all an offer does is define the parties. Yeah. And I thought that was really, really helpful to me to understand this concept to say, there are all kinds of offers, but they don't become something until they're accepted. That's and exactly. that, that to me is really, really helpful because, you know, my whole history is in direct response fundraising. And in a direct response, we make offers. And one of the things that you, you know about marketing and advertising and all that is that the offer defines the responder. Yes. And so, for example... You know, a lot of direct response offers are not advertising. They're actually very, very different. They're transactional in nature. And these offers are one to say, you have a choice. I'm giving you a choice, yes or no. Is this offer something that you would want to take? And so, so much of direct response marketing is to say, I'll give you something in exchange for your agreement. And what yeah. you're saying is the thing I'll give you in exchange for your agreement is standing. Now I am a part owner in this, right? You have, I, I've gotcha. How that is such a big idea. Anyway, I just wanted to, because that blew my mind, this idea of defining the offer defines this responder, but it defines the parties in the transaction. The standing of the parties in the transaction. Well, okay. So let's take that to another step. So I come to you, you know, I say, Hey, would you like to buy my house? I didn't offer the neighbor. I didn't offer your neighbor that. Right. Right. I offered you. And so yep. by presenting the offer, it's between you and me now, not between me and your neighbor. Yes. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to get that clear. Yeah. Now let's look at the standing. See, I don't have, because you've made me the offer doesn't give me standing to offer your house to somebody else. Not yet. It does not give me the standing to pay your electric bill. Right. It does not give me the standing to actually decide when I'm going to mow your lawn or trim your hedges. It is simply an offer. And in that offer, what that offer does is it defines the standing of the offerer. Okay. So if you actually own your house and you extend the offer to me to buy your house, and you're the owner, then you have the authority, the standing to transfer the ownership of that house to me should I accept your offer. Wow. But what happens if I don't own your house 
and I make the offer and I accept your offer and I give you what you ask and then you leave your way and I go to, I say, now give me the keys and you bolt and I go to the homeowner and I go to open the door and he says, what are you doing here? Wow. Well, I bought your house. From who? Well, this guy made me an offer. He told me you own your house. He told me he had the authority to do this. And I accepted his transaction. I gave him what he wanted. He gave me the keys. I'm simply opening the door to take possession of what I own. And the guy says, nope. Sorry, dude. That guy had no standing. Yes. Okay. That makes it super clear. Okay. Now, take that very transaction. The transaction still occurred. See, I stay, still gave the thing of value to the one who made the offer. But I found out the hard way that the one who made the offer didn't have the authority to make the offer. Wow. So it was with the serpent. The serpent was exercising judgment over God and what he had said and was and was issuing decrees of rulership and he possessed no authority to do it. But Eve bought the offer. So this, when is the she, first, this is the first scam in history, Steve. This is it. Well, the first scam was with the serpent. Yeah. Second scam was with the was with Eve, and there's a whole reason for that progression, by the way. But the point, but the whole, but the point of the whole matter is, Satan was offering what he did not have the authority, what he did not possess, nor did he have the authority to offer. But once she accepted the offer, she came under the authority of what he was saying. And when she did, she subordinated herself to him. Yep. And by doing that, gave him standing as being superior to her. Now he became the ruler of her. And she now became the, the agent of him. Okay. She still is the one who possessed the authority. He, but, but he now was given standing as being superior to her. That's why, by the way, why the why the scriptures say that man became lower than the angels for a little while. That's how it happened. Okay, so that's the nature of transaction. The entire purpose in this dynamic between this the spiritual world of darkness and the kingdom of God and God's man in between those is to gain standing, and through that standing authority through the mechanism of transaction, an offer and an acceptance. And it happens every day, every time. Okay, so how are we doing so far? This is amazing. And it's you're, you're teeing up so many applications I can think of <clears throat> that this relates to, but I want, I want you to take the step further before I share anything. Okay, so by the way, I'm talking in spiritual terms, but I'm not talking in religious terms. I'm talking about how this happens every single day. Yeah. Okay. So now what is sin? So what ends up happening, let's kind of walk through this again. So the serpent enters, gains authority over the serpent through the mechanism of transaction. The serpent now becomes the agent that goes to Eve. Eve now makes the offer to Eve, um, the same offer to Eve that was made to the serpent, that Satan made to the serpent. Eve accepts the offer. When she accepts the offer, she now comes under the authority of, uh, of Satan, who was under the authority, excuse me, under the authority of the serpent, who was under the authority of Satan. And she now comes under the authority of Satan. Satan has now been granted standing as a ruler and he now rules over her and she sends him to Adam who came under her authority who is now under the serpent's authority 
to now trans complete the transaction of transferring the authority to rule the earth over to Satan and his kingdom. Wow. And here we are. Yep. Here we are. We got to stop right there. That's the pause. Wow. So when people talk about the fall of man, and of course I've listened to so many sermons about this and, you know, what happened prior to it, what did the garden look like? You know, you know, you've asked some amazing questions like, was God aware that the serpent was there? Well, yeah, does God aware that Satan came in and did all this stuff? But what's amazing to me about this is you you say in the fullness of his nature and character, you're meant to rule. And then here's this story of the giving up of that authority, right? And saying, I'm going to come up underneath you. You're going to have standing over me. And now it makes complete sense why he would kick them out. Yes. And now you think about this idea. So so what, one of the things that is a bit of an aside, but I think it's also helpful in this is they knew they were naked. And then we talked, I think, a couple of weeks ago about how it probably took them some time to figure out fig leaves could cover their genitalia, right? You're like, I, I'm always fascinated with what, what did they cover? They covered the things that were different about them. They felt shame. They knew they were naked. And of course, I love it that God comes with, the Father comes with questions, yeah. right? As if like, you know, and the funny thing is like, as if he didn't know what was going on. But you also made this point that this was part of his plan. Yeah. And so here's the big question for me. It's hard for me in some respects to go, he intended for us to fall. Yeah. Well, why, why, what would you say to that? Like, help me understand that. Why did he intend for us to fall? Well, what I would say to you is that falling is part of the upside down world. Okay. He didn't intend for them to fall. He intended for them to graduate to the next level. Ah, uh, okay. So had they graduated to the next level, they would have said no to the offer and they would continue to rule his creation and his nature and character with him. Well, sort of. See, the, the issue, the issue in the, what we, what we are taught in the fall is what man had done is this dastardly deed that threw a wrench into God's plan. Right. And so this perfect plan that he had was now all screwed up because man, you know, did the deed. Well, if that's the case, then, then what does that say about God? Yeah. If me as a created being can throw a wrench into his plans, then what good of, how good of a planner is he? True. See? And so no, there, there's something wrong. Man did not fall. Man graduated to the next level. Up to that point in time, man only knew good. Okay. He did not, he, he had no concept of what evil was. He only knew good. Here's another one. Okay. Jehovah says to him, in the day you eat, you will surely die. Not if you eat, but in the day you eat, you will surely die. What did dying look like to them? See, that would be to me, that would be like me saying to you, okay, Matt, if you do this, then you will surely pabellum. Right. What's that? I have no idea what that is. See? Well, what's pabellum? Well, pabellum is when this, that, and you, well, what, what the heck is pabellum? I, I don't even know what pabellum is. I have no concept of what death is. No concept of what death was, no concept of what evil was, no concept of any of those things. Well, the question is, how are you going to rule with Jesus if you don't even know what evil and death are? Wow. How are you going to rule the entirety of his creation with him if you don't even know what the components of his creation com are comprised of? You know what's so interesting about this? Like, I'm going to use a, a, an analogy Many of our friends watching, and including myself, have played a, a couple of video games in our day. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, when you go into a complex video game, you know what they do? You're in a lobby to begin with, and you have to go through training in the lobby before you can go out into the world. Okay, That's just how games are created, because there's complex mechanics, 
there's all these things. Well, how do I forage? How do I gather things? What do I do? And you are in this lobby when you start out and when you're new to it to understand the context of the world that you're about to enter. Yeah. And it seems like to me, there's an analogy there that seems to fit pretty well is that you're in this place. You have to understand my intent is that you and my purpose is that you will rule over all this creation. You know, you're in a garden and this idea of a garden seems like a kind of preserve or lobby in a way, but you're going to be, you're going to have to go out into this. And my intent the whole time was that you would rule with me in my nature and character. But in order to rule, you have to understand the difference between good and evil. Yes. That is and mind life, numbing. And life and death. Yeah. See, you, you have to understand what contributes to life. My kingdom is a kingdom of life. If the intruder of death shows up, what are you going to do with it? Wow. Yeah. Well, and then look at the temptation of Christ comes yeah. out and he's like, and guys, this for me is like the, the atomic bomb of like simplicity and complexity all in one. Yeah. And it's like, no, what did Jesus, he modeled the way for us. He yeah. literally, here comes the tempter, right? And says, all right. And this is the same guy in the garden yeah. appears to him and says, all right, you know, you're probably pretty hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? No, and, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. That's, go, what, go, go. that's what we're taught. No, the word if is a is a, a word of challenge. Okay. Oh, if you are the son of God, I see. Yeah. If see, you are. when you say if, what is he now requiring Jesus to do? Prove it. Prove it. Yeah. Okay. Who has the authority to demand proof? The one was standing. The the one was standing. Did say did the devil have standing to challenge? Jesus to demand that he prove who he was. Do you see how humongous that is? That it hangs on the word if that's yeah. just monumental. Yeah. Right. Cause what you're doing, it's, it's like this idea of trickery. I'm going to trick you. If you are, prove it to me. So I have standing over you. It, it sounds very reasonable. How reasonable you're the good, you're the dude. Hey, listen, man, this is a very reasonable thing. Just show us who you are. And if you'll prove to us who you are, man will accept everything you have to say. Well, now everything is flooding back to me yeah. in the actual Passion Week. And now what I see yeah. is so many people are saying to him, well, if you're so-and-so, if you're the king of the Jews, if you're this stuff. And, you know, a lot of times you're like, Jesus, why don't you do something? And when you understand this concept of standing, no, I, I and it's, it so resonates as beautiful. Because, you know, it's evidence to me, too, that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. Yes. Because he's consistent throughout the whole thing. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, look what happened when the, when the Pharisees and the religious leaders challenged him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He never dealt with, in every instance, what they were asking him to do was to grant them standing. Okay. Okay. Through this mechanism of reaction. And so this is an entirely different element to it. But what, what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do in the garden was to react to the challenge. Yeah, draw you off sides. See? If you, because here's what happens once again. A reaction is a second action to a first action. Okay? Now we can take this right back into the garden. Yeah. We can apply it to our everyday life right here and now in the thousands of decisions you'll make in the next month, weeks, and years. It, it's the same game play over and over and over and over and over again. It's the mechanism of transaction. So it's let's an offer you're going to accept. And when you do, you grant the kingdom of darkness standing. And when it takes that standing, it now chooses to rule you because you have transferred to them the thing that's most valuable that you have, which is your authority. Oh my gosh. Okay. Whew. We made it to this spot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So let's talk about sin. So yeah. I'm going to give you probably some faulty thinking here and you help me correct this, but this is what, what I, what blew my mind. 
we've been taught that sickness is, I'm sorry, that, that sin is a sickness and that it is a, an ailment and it's almost like you are crippled with it. Yeah. Okay. What, what I've come to understand here in the last week or so is that if I understand sin in the terms of transaction and I, and I think of these things as a series of things, I then think about very practical things, right? Yeah. So me in my flesh, you know, having this ability to choose between good and evil, I'm wandering around this place, whether I'm considering God in all of this or not, I te- I'm very tempted to go my own way, and here comes an offer. Yeah. And so rather than saying and thinking that sin is just some goop that I swim in, it's no, these offers are made to you all the time. And I think about this as it relates to porn a very big one for men. And I, I, what really got me really, you know, connected with this idea is that, hold on a second. I remembered the verse and the verse is um, that really, and it's funny, like I, I memorized first Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you may or can endure it. There's something so big, because I, I, I'd i memorized that long ago. And now to think about it in these terms, Jesus is there. If you are who you say you are, turn these stones into bread. And he says, nope, I live by every word that comes out. Man does not live on bread alone, but out of every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And I I stick myself in that situation now, and I say, hold on. Okay, if no temptation has seized me, except what is common to man, then these things are known. They're common. And so if they're common, and there is the promise that you can stand up underneath them, and that there is a way out, that what you said about ruling with Jesus and his nature and character is saying no to those offers. Yes. Yes. Now let's go back into the garden. Yes, absolutely. See, what we have been told about sin has nothing to do with what sin is. The consequence for sin, as we've been told, has nothing to do with the consequence of sin. I mean, it is all a manipulation and a redefinition that when you pause to unpack it, It is absolute nonsense at its core. But because we have accepted it as true, we accept it as the truth. And so we abide by it. So now let's go back into the back into the garden. Okay. The vision of the father was that his man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. So what was the sin that Eve committed? Accepting the offer. Okay. She accepted the offer. How did she accept the offer? By giving away standing and her authority. Yeah. Isn't this fascinating? We don't even know. Yeah. yeah. I'm making sure I don't get it wrong too, Steve. Well, <laughs> hey, listen, don't be afraid because I got them all wrong too. So I, you know, I've got a zero on my on my test with Jesus too, so don't don't worry about it. Okay. But but see, voicing these things that were taught, even when we say them, we don't really know what they mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can say that she ate of the tree and the standard fare is because she disobeyed God. Right. Okay. Well, how did she disobey God? How did she do it? Well, she ate of the tree when he told him not to. No. She made the decision to accept the offer independent of the one she was designed to rule with. So what? not with him, on her own. So she went on her own. Yes, that's exactly right. The serpent was was telling her everything was engaging in this conversation. And the first thing the serpent did was the serpent took a position of authority that it did not possess. And it began to lay out 
who God was and what he meant. Those are prerogatives of rulership. And instead of her saying, okay, let's pause a second. Jehovah, what do you think about this? Yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting this offer to eat from the tree that you said not to eat from. You said I was going to die if I did this. Have no clue what dying is. This guy is telling me not only am I not going to die, I'm going to be like the, like the Elohim if I do it. Father, what do you say about that? Jehovah, what's up? Is this dude for real? I've been asking a lot of questions about this. I'm not quite sure how to handle this part of my responsibility. I've got a lot of pressures that are coming against me. I've got to, I've got to do a few of these things. And this is the idea, the thought, the concept that's coming to me. See, for us, it's not, the, it's not the serpent crawling up or standing up in front of us and starting to yak with us. It is the self inside of us talking with us that's making us think it's our thoughts of reason that are occurring. And so what we don't do, what we do is we reason our way out of it and say, okay, let's do that. Sin is not the action, the sin is the attitude to act apart from God. Okay, that, that needs to be said again too. Sin is not the action. It is the attitude to act apart from God. Wow. I am equipped to make my decisions on my own. I don't need your input until I call on you. Guess what? That's sin. Well, now, I mean, I keep coming back to this. If you are who you are, turn the stones into bread. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, the meaning of this. And then you think about, I just get overwhelmed by the grace of all of this. Because yeah. yes, when Jesus comes, there's so much that he shares. Yes. There's so much modeling that he provides. And it's almost like, I know you're stupid. I'm going to share this with you 50 different ways from Sunday. Yeah. And I'm going to basically establish the same thing over and over and over again. And hopefully you get it through your thick skull. And still we don't, right? Yeah. But but it's amazing to me because what you've said this all along, and this is what I've understood as we've kind of journeyed on this, is that it's surprisingly simple. It is so simple. It's mind-blowingly simple. Well, and I think also, don't you think the, the work of Satan is to make it seem complex by the oh. creations of man and all that stuff is like, it's all the stuff that gets in the way. And you know, what's really, I've said this so many times, I feel like we're called. My grandmother said he's always been enough. Yeah. And what she meant by that was exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. That literally journeying with him daily, considering and saying, all right, I do nothing apart from you. You're the only one who has authority over me. I'm listening to you. Guide my steps. You know, what do you think about this? I like the way you do it. You're like, hey, man, what do you think about this? And you're like considering it. And then then I think about the scriptures like hold every thought captive. Yeah. Well, what would it look like to do that? And then, and then it just blows my mind. I think about Jesus shows up in the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, you know, you know about the, the Moses guy and you know about the Ten Commandments. You know, he showed you what this reflected to you, what this dividing line was, you know, of what these things were. But you have no context of how deep this goes. You know, even if you look at a woman, you've committed adultery. And I'm like, like the stakes got raised so much. Now it, it, now it, it makes it so clear that of why Jesus came. Why did the Father send him into this world? And why, why did he do what he did? And why, when he was you know, sweating blood, did he ask the Father to remove the cup from him? He's like, nope, this is what we had intended all along. And I think the thing that is so revolutionary about this is so many people in their efforts to try to work for God and do something for God have set up all kinds of gates and barriers that stand in between 
the ultimate middleman. And it, it, what's so amazing to me, Steve, is that this is a crypto channel. Mm -hmm. And the very nature of what we're talking about is this idea of decentralization and going direct. You know, in this Hex and Pulse and Texan and PulseX world, we talk about immutability and we talk about it's just you and the contract. You hold the keys. You have authority over your keys. Don't give your keys to someone else. If you give them to centralized exchanges, you lose everything. And it says, no, you have the sovereign ownership of these keys, which is a really interesting you know, dynamic. And if you want to engage with this hex contract, it's just you and the contract. And it's immutable. There are no admin keys and no one, no counterparty involved in this. And it resonates so much with me that this very picture of the things that are happening in very natural sense of the reordering of the financial system are a reflection of the creation at its core purpose of that so many people are telling you and distracting you with essentially being a middleman. And what I love about our, our friendship and all the stuff that's every single time you tell me, ask him yourself. It's beautiful, man. It is so beautiful. Well, it's, it is, it is so astoundingly simple when you get back to the fundamentals. Yeah. Okay. The father's vision is that we would rule his creation with him, with him in the fullness of his nature and character so that his nature and character is fully developed in us because that is the foundation upon which we rule with him. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I want to do that. I have no idea how to do that, Lord. Well, don't worry about that. Just follow me. I'll get it done. You know what this, it, it reminds me of apprenticeship. Yeah. And so let's say, you know, I, I was, I like to watch people make stuff. Right. And one of the things I love is I want, like watching, there's these old Japanese men, who have spent their entire lifetimes making samurai swords. And there's this certain kind of carbon steel. There's a hand, there's a hand forging process and it is so laborious, but you cannot be a master swordsmith in Japan unless you've put in like 50 years of apprenticeship. And what it reminds me of is this idea that I'm always looking to the master the master bladesmith. And I'm saying, all right. And he's like, nope. You know, he's like, nope, you got to keep sharpening because you, you're not, you haven't graduated to the next level, son. But you watch what the father's doing. Look what I'm doing. Yes. And you have, you have to put in that time. And it feels a lot like apprenticeship in the sense that I could leave and I could go make my own sword company. But if you want to be connected to this tradition, and you want to be connected to this authority and you want to be connected to this thing. You've got to be connected to the master. And I know that's a, a human example of it, but it feels a lot like this to say, hold on, what is this life that is full? Because there's so many promises in this following him and, and, and abiding in him and ruling in his nature and character. And we know that there's so many benefits that are, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all these things that you're, you're, you're given that, that exist outside of anything that we could potentially create ourselves, that there's so much incentive built into it. And in a way, I feel like everyone is just searching and searching for these things. And what is enlightening about this is to say, when you understand the simplicity of it, you recognize that he's a father who loves you and literally wants you to be connected to him. And it's, it's unbelievable, dude. This is it, crazy. It, I mean, think about this for a second. The kingdom of darkness does not come to us and stand in front of us as a, as a spiritual being and say and make an offer to us. What it does is it speaks to us through our thoughts, through the, you know, through the self thoughts, 
through the ideas of others, through the broadcast concepts that are, that are in front of us. And so it starts imparting ideas in our minds that we then start to act on. And there's a whole process by which that occurs, but that's the simplicity of it. Once we begin to act on it all by our own, we have now committed what the kingdom of God considers sin. Sin is nothing more than choosing to act independently from God. That's all it is. Okay. I, I have decided to act on my own apart from you, Father. And so that's what I'm going to do. So right. let, me, let me ask you this question then. What about the Ten Commandments? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, oh, so just let me just dissect it because I don't mean it just in general. I mean it very specifically. So the same one who created it all is interfacing with Moses, right? And gives him these, these rules, right? The law. And I would assume before that, you know, maybe there were some things they inherently knew, but this was like the rule book, right? And this is the first rule book. And it says, you know, <laughs> these are the things you shouldn't do. These are the things you should do. So the question I've got is, in, in a way, it feels like the establishment of those tablets also created a problem for man because it was easier to go your own way because I could now worship the tablets in a golden box. And it's almost like you created something that in a way has become a stumbling block for me. And I'm not trying to criticize God for creating the Ten Commandments, but it illustrated something, but it almost established this idea that, hey, these are my words, these are my rules. Rather than being connected to a moment by moment, I now have this distraction of us carrying around these stones in a box. How do you, like, how do you, how do you process that? Because it almost seems like counter to this idea of actually being moment by moment listening to him. How, how, do you, how do you explain that? Well, to me, the fascinating question is why were they even necessary? That, that's my point. Why well, were they even necessary? Well, okay. So now that, they be, now that they are present, did anyone ever stop and say, okay, why are these now necessary? Why does somebody have to tell me not to commit adultery? Why does somebody have to tell me not to kill my pal? Why do I have to tell somebody not to covet what my brother has? Why does somebody have to do that? If I've got my act together, why, do I, why does somebody even have to tell me that? Because you don't have your act together. Ah, whoa, Jesus. Why are you telling me this? Why is this something that I even need for somebody to put in front of me as an acceptable mode of conduct? Why is that? What is happening there? And oh, by the way, the law did not do anything to help them. Not one bit. All it did was another example of it doesn't matter what you do. If you do it apart from me, you will end up in the same spot every single time. By the way, weren't the Pharisees of Jesus' day spotless when it came to the, to the requirements of the law? Well, yeah, look at Paul, Hebrew among Hebrews. Yeah. Were they, were they void and absent of sin just because they kept all the rules of the law? Wow. What, about, what about the guy who was the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Well, go and do what the, what the, the law says. I've done every bit of this around the time I was, a, I was a youth. From the time I was a kid, I've done it all. Well, then why do you think that you need to be saved then? What is it that's going on inside you that's causing you to know when everybody else will consider that you are spotless before God in your conduct and behavior? What is it that's going on inside you? Well, Jesus now, says, okay, here's what you do. You, learn, you, want, you want to have this thing that you, you want to be saved, 
delivered out of your danger and, and into safety, you want that to happen for you, here's what you do. You do exactly what I ask you to do. Well, what is that? Go sell everything and follow me. Whoa, whoa, I can't do that. Ah, now you know why you think you need to be saved. Yeah. It's right there in front of you. And yet you can't see it. Do you want to see it? Wow. See, so all of this, virtually every bit of it is, is what the game is designed to achieve. It's like Abner Doubleday sitting on top of the game of baseball and hey, there are people who, get, who strike out, there are people who hit home runs, there are people who commit strikeouts. Every one of them are competing against each other. And though they may hate the fact that they are failing in the middle of the game, that failure is part of the game. Yep. And Abner isn't the least bit bothered by it. It's part of the game. Because you fail today, the one who caused you to fail will make you stronger tomorrow so that you don't fail. Well, you told that story about the, the first curveball you saw and it <laughs> fell off the table and you're like, I got to figure out how to hit this thing. And you're like, well, that failure caused you to keep working and understand it, how to, it enabled you to see what was possible too. Well, that's exactly right. It, it revealed to me that there was a bigger world out there that I didn't understand. That's what this whole thing is about. Folks, there is a bigger world out there that God has created that he's inviting us to join him in ruling with him. If you're not willing to rule your, or your life yourself, then why will you then be able to go to the next step? Yeah. See, it, it, these things are, they're, they are so fundamental. It is it blows your mind how simple they are. And it's all based on choice. You okay. Know? So now this revelation came with the whole description of the law. So when they asked Jesus and they said, what are the most important commandments? And I, this is like, wow, I've never seen it this way before to love the Lord, your God. Right. And you think about this idea of being connected to him, yeah. love him with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. And you know what's so amazing about that? Because it's it's really interesting how crypto and the calling on my life to unlock global generosity and this, you know, the illustrations of loving one's neighbor, right? David Lee, right? Coming to my dad's funeral, you know, just these acts of love. And to think that, how amazing to understand, because what it does is it works on like 50 different levels. Okay, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Well, what we've just defined is it's easy, it's simple. And you said really, I think one of the first times we ever met, you said, you can ask God himself, you can ask Jesus himself, show me and teach me how to hear from you. Yeah. Rather than going to some guru or listening to some sermon or doing something like that, Go to the source with your immutable contract. Go with your keys that you have ownership of and go put them in the lock and say, all right, hey. And that's the thing that I think has been, is really interesting about this is because we talked about the beginning. There are people who have different personalities and they want to see things in different ways. And there's a, there's provision there for every one of them, right? But the, the correlation between loving God and loving each other, it makes me think about this idea of you and I are sons, right? So we are made in his image, conformed to his likeness. You're investing your time and energy and effort to help me along. I'm coming to this understanding and it's blowing my mind to the fullness of the joy that can be in walking with him and, and, and doing this life with him. <sighs> And it's just, um, it's amazing because the concept of sin that we're talking about here, if I start seeing things, and I practice it this week, if I see these things as offers being made, it's almost like we constantly are repeating the same thing that Eve dealt with. Yeah. Like every single moment where 
you know, it, it could be, so let me, I'm going to illustrate like a litany of things. So I could ask Jesus, hey, I've got diabetes. I've got some challenges health-wise. Um, what do you think about that? Or on the other hand, I could say, well, I feel a lot better when I drink a lot of alcohol. I feel a lot better when I take some drugs and pills. I feel better when I hallucinate on mushrooms. I feel a lot better when I, you know, cheat on my wife or do whatever it is, you know. And then you think about these as offers to satiate this pain rather than going to the source and saying, hey, because he wants to deal with the, the, the core, right? He wants to deal with the foundation and fundamental things within us. But it's like we've all, there's so much corruption. You talked about lawlessness in this world, you know, and I talk about in terms of financial world and, you know, all of these things that are pushing back on us and everyone wants to control us and everything. And when you apply this filter and you think about this simply, the one who is prowling around trying to devour us, same one that was in the garden and this constant offer and constant offer and constant offer and, and in a way created such ineffectiveness in us because it's been such a distraction. And, you know, now I think about this idea of um, you're not an accident. You know, what are taught in school? You know, over billions and billions of years, you came out of the ooze and accidentally trip and fell into who you are. And it's like, well, that's one of the biggest lies that could ever have been told. But out of that lie comes so many other things because it's like, well, you know, now I think about the guys who are like, you need to be an alpha male, man. You need to go out there and manifest it yourself, man. Like you can do this, like step on people's heads and the very core nature of going it your, on your own, you can do some things. I can plow some ground. I can do some things in this structure and framework of creation, but it's always leaving me wanting and it doesn't fulfill this. And it's like, it's, um, and, it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that it all points back to the same place. And it's almost like, you're, you know, in, in some respects, you're helping me avoid a lot of future pain by thinking in terms of holding each thought captive with Jesus, walking with him, asking him about every step of the way, and resting in him and saying, okay, you've got this. Then, then, I, then this is a big, like, crisis for me. Steve, I talk about change in the world. Richard Hart talks about change in the world. People in the Compassion Cartel, they're like, we got all this money. We're going to change the world. I got to stop saying that. Yeah. He, well, on one hand, you could say he has already changed the world. Yeah. But the secondary piece of this is that if he's, the, if he's speaking and he's out front and he is the shepherd and we recognize his voice, that what we're doing is we're following him as he changes the world. Yeah. Because going our own way is, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to give money to these people, and I'm going to do this thing. You can't do anything apart from me. And in fact, if you do it apart from me, it's sin. And I go, so hold on. Is this life that is full and pressed down and overflowing as simple as literally following you moment by moment and and in asking you for the guidance and help and that you will literally redeem everything in my life and direct a path and ultimately thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Is this actually the unlocking of it? Is actually, in some respects, like stay in your lane, bro. Like in a way, it's like know your place, but also recognize that I'm a father who loves you and will provide for you. And, and it blows my mind that he would provide for us in the midst of us going our own way. Yeah. Cause I feel like I, I go now that I think about him, like I go my own way all the time and he's still, patient. <laughs> he's still patient with me. And why would he like guide my steps and all this? Is it because before the beginning of time, before the creation of time, these things were planned out. You know, what's interesting is when I first came to know the Lord, you know, September 10th of 2000, he showed me the power and it was like raw. It was like weight lifted off of me, but I had to experience that way or I wouldn't have believed that it had real power. 
because I was like, literally everyone else is like playing a game and this seems super hokey and it's a bunch of nerds and this is not for me. And, but it wasn't until I was at that spot where it was like, no, he made it tangibly real for me. And it was just the introduction to, I mean, it was almost a taste or the smell of the brisket, a yeah. little taste of it to see, wow, hold on, this is real stuff. What you're saying is this is, this redefines the gospel to me in its beauty, in the simplicity of yeah. to say, this is not a religion. No. This is a journey with Jesus. Well, ab absolutely. And, and what happens, speaking from my own experience, Matt, is that what happens is you're, the way you start viewing your life around you starts dramatically changing and with it, your vocabulary. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a couple of examples just in the things that you, that you mentioned there. A lion roaming around trying to devour you. You have a certain way of saying that. How is it that you say that? Yeah. Yeah. One that prowls around and seeks to, yeah, looking to, well, really ultimately tempt you, right? Well, so, so here is the point. If he could devour you, then why is he trying to devour you? Yeah. There you go. He's not if capable. He He's not you, capable. Then why is he seeking to devour you? Why doesn't he just do it? Why didn't he just do it? Because he's not, he doesn't have the authority to do it. That's right. And what is it that he's looking for when he's trying? What is it that he is looking for that gives him the opportunity to actually satisfy his insatiable appetite for man's authority? What is he looking for? An opening. He's looking for a, an offer that the man will accept. Yes. And he's creative. And he's very creative. Incredible. Incredibly gifted. He's been doing it a long time. Wow. Okay. That's why it's common to man. Wow. Okay. He's just doing it over and over and over again. But guess what is also common to man? That God is right there with you. Jesus is right there with you, just as he was with Cain. Look at Steve. You see what's happening here. Take a step back. Slow down just a bit. Let's take a better look at this thing. By the way, Cain, if will your, not, will your countenance not be lifted? Will you not become happy and one of a higher order of character. Won't you become that one if you do what is right? Well, what is right? Learning to rule with me. Why? Because sin is crouching at the door for you. Yeah. See? Well, why is it crouching at the door? Why isn't it just blasting the door down? It doesn't have full access. It doesn't have the authority to do it. It doesn't have the keys. We have the keys. We're the ones that unlock the door and say, come on in. So for those that don't know the story of Cain and Abel, can you explain that background so that people understand what that transaction was there when he slew his brother? Oh, yeah. That. Okay, here you have Jesus now telling Jehovah now telling um, Adam and Eve and the serpent and the devil what, what the consequence of their transaction was going to bring. And what it was bringing with death, it was bringing, you know, uh, taking them from abundance to scarcity. It was taking them from being very productive and, um, and the yield of fruit to now thorns and thistles and all kinds of petty, you know, pain and heartache and headache and hassles and all the stuff that was going on now that this transaction has been completed. So now they have their children. Interesting that, that Jehovah didn't allow them to have children until they did the deed and entered into this dimension of knowing both good and evil. 
Now that's what you want to have your head wrecked a little bit. Talk to Jesus about that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then what they're doing is they're now Cain, the firstborn, and Abel, the secondborn, are now um, old enough and grown enough to where they are now, you know, presenting offerings to Jehovah. And the offerings, and Cain puts his, you know, builds his offerings around the fruit of the ground, and because he was a farmer, and Abel was a, was a um, sheep herder, so he offered, you know, from, you know, from his flock. And the way it dis, the the way that Moses described it was that, and Jehovah had regard for Abel's offering, but he did not have regard for Cain's. Okay, so let's back up and okay, why didn't he have, why did he have regard for Abel's offering? Why did he do that? Well, because Abel offered his offering with Jehovah. It was an expression of his partnership. It was an expression of his gratitude. It was an expression of his relationship. It was something that he did with him. And so Jehovah had regard for it. He accepted it. Okay. Well, what about what about Cain? Why didn't he why didn't he accept his? Because the offering was out of Cain's motivation for gaining God's acceptance. It was self-centered. How do you know it was self-centered? Because sin was crouching at the door. See, he knew what the motivation was, the attitude was in his offering. Man, I, did, I, I gave you the best I had and you didn't even accept it. I wasn't rejecting your offering. I was, I was rejecting the attitude you had in your offering. This was about you. This was not about us. Oh, by the way, now that you're a little bummed and it's all over your face, we can change that. You know that, Cain? We can change that. All you have to do is learn to master sin. Wow. The propensity to think, to act, to decide apart from me. Start learning to live with me and all of that changes for you. And, and he kills his brother. What's your choice, King? Isn't it fascinating that Jehovah did not intercept Cain's choice. Yep. Why? Because Cain had the authority to rule. And he chose to exercise his rule apart from God. And when he did, it brought death and, death and destruction. And it's been doing it ever since. That's why I ask, okay, look around us. Nobody says they're lawless, and yet we're swimming and drowning in lawlessness. Why? Because the only way we know how to think, act, and decide is on our own. It's the only way we're taught how to, how to think, act, and decide. You were mentioning, okay, isn't it interesting that we're on a crypto channel? Well, have anyone stopped to think that maybe there's a pretty big deal going on here? And what Jesus is trying to do is trying to say, hey, folks, you can either do what you're doing and end up in the same boat. Or you can take a look at doing something maybe a little different. What's your interest? You interest in learning how to do something a little different? Hey, it's there right in front of you. But so is the other option. Which one do you choose? It's, you know, when like you ring a bell, I think about a big bell, right? And you hit it hard and it just resonates and it continues to ring. Yeah. That's what this feels like to me. It feels like it resonates so deeply. And you know how sound travels? It yeah. doesn't, it's not pointed in a direction. It's 
all, it's it's out and it continues to propagate. And I sense that <clears throat> the things that are true resonate with our souls, right? And and the neat thing about this is I just sense that internally, right? When I when I come to understand these things, it's like it's a breath in. It's like a it's an awe, but it's also a resonating, but it also leads to more questions. And it's like, well, go to him and ask him. And I think one of the cool things, Steve, about just how God has gifted you and, you know, your discipline of following him and the fact that you've been a professional baseball player and in some strange sort of ways, those disciplines are being applied to seeking, seeking the face of God and asking him, Hey, what do you think about this? And to think that he would, and that's the, I think that's the big promise in all this stuff, you know, this isn't reserved for just Steve. And I think that's the amazing thing about this is that, you know, what are the implications of all this, Steve? And I think about like where we are in just the times we live in and then to think of the tools that he has put in front of us. And then when you start saying, okay, tools are animated for good or for evil, right? You know, some people are like chat GPT is the devil. And I'm like, well, Actually, I use ChatGPT to help me do my punctuation, and, and it really helped me like have an editor. But I didn't, you know, I didn't use ChatGPT to, you know, find ways to, you know, murder people. I mean, that could animate it in a lot of different ways. And then I think about crypto, and I think about okay, these people got into this stuff. It's almost like, and, and, and you you pushed back on me on this one a while back around this idea that him it would leave the 99 and come to get the one and you know is 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 Jesus really pursuing us and I think you really pushed back on some of that thoughts or chasing after us but there is something that seems like he constantly is trying to get our attention do you agree with that like it just seems like he's everywhere and especially as people open him up and say hey is this really true? Is what this stuff Steve's is saying, is it really true? And that, could I really ask you? And that it doesn't have to be through the context of some, well, you have to be a Methodist in order to do this. And you're like, no, I could just like do this on the side of my bed, or I could do this when I get up in the morning and have some coffee, or I could do it right now. And what do you think about that? Do you, do you think that, do you think that Jesus is actively pursuing people? Well, he just is. I mean, he is the shepherd. So guess what? The shepherd, it takes care of his sheep. One of his sheep was in trouble. So he went to take care of his sheep. See, so, so he, it, so yes, he is everywhere in the sheep concept. He, he is there as the good shepherd. He takes care of and leads and leads the sheep. Um, But the sheep, if you will, there is a reciprocating element to it. And the sheep got to want to do it. The sheep got to want to be cared for, right? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like chicks, you know, like a mother hen gathers her chicks to protect. But you would not accept it. You would not. You did not recognize the day of your visitation. Well, kicking, kicking at the goads. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds. Of, and now we could point... We could point the finger at their failure. Or we can say, well, Jesus, what was actually going on there? What was happening there from your point of view? I use the vocabulary that you are here to change things. Are you really here to change things? No, Steve. I'm here to complete things. I am here to complete my father's vision. And every time I speak, I am speaking another creative act. I am creating and completing in those who are interested, my father's vision. Steve, are you interested? Is that something you're interested in being a part of? If you are, just ask me. I'll show you how to get there. I'll totally equip you. I'll totally train you. But you got to get in the game. You can't learn to hit the curveball unless you face the curveball. Huh. 
See, you can't be in the game unless you're willing to accept the risk of the game. See? Come on, this is okay, you'll be fine. But you have to be interested. Yeah. Well, I'm and not you know changing the world, I'm completing the world. Do you want to be a part of that completion? Well, there's so much, there's so much here. And I keep I come back to Jesus pushing back from the shoreline because there's so many people and he gives them an agricultural story. And then you you we had this conversation privately, but you said um the 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 term that's used for church is ecclesia. Yeah. And what does it really mean? And what what what's the definition? It is the it is one who has been called out from and to him. So they so it's a it's a bi-directional bi-directional word. It means not just called call to, but it's called out from one to another. So think about this, folks. The term that's used, that's universally used in the scripture that you're likely reading is the word church. And then there's definitions, I think, that we've applied to those and made assumptions that church is like that building in Acts 2.42. There's certainly benefits of community. But what I think is really illustrated so well in the word ecclesia is that in, in all the definitions of the difference between weeds and wheat and sheep and goats and those that would fall and those that don't, is that he revealed, and folks, I think this to me is so big because it's so big for me, is you said a lot of the people went home after they heard a great story from Jesus and said, that's a great agricultural story. But there are those who are defined in, by him as the ecclesia, the ones that were called out and to him. Yeah. And he revealed to them what it meant. And what mm -hmm. I look at you, Steve, I go, you're somebody who didn't go home. You just kept running and chasing after him. Going, what do you mean by that? Yeah. And, you know, a strange sort of way, you're doing exactly the same thing they did. Hey, what do you mean by that? I don't really quite understand that thing. Okay. If you're willing to chase after me, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's exactly right. That it, I know you, I have learned this. I have learned this vocabulary. Jesus, I know you got more up your sleeve than what you just said. What is it? Yeah. See, and now it's kind of somewhat of a game because, you know, and I'm going to use a term that you and I have talked about before. I'm no longer crab walking. Yeah. See, when you first start, you have to really exercise almost an exaggeration of effort in order to get the body and the mind and the spirit trained in this new way of living. See, living from the mindset that he's changing to living to the mindset that he's finishing. Wow. wow. You know, How does that work? You know what's so amazing is, I was just thinking about this, you know, somebody's like, I'm going to be a pastor, right? And I'm going to start a church, right? And I think about this idea well, let's say you, you started a church and you said, you know what, we're going to teach this stuff, Steve. We're going to teach people that we're going to follow after God. We're going to be those who listen to his voice. He's alive and he speaks. And we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to go in this direction. We're going to, this is what we're going to be about. And all the things we talked about, a group of people comes together and they say, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Do you know how threatening it is to the pastor when the people actually follow Jesus? Do you know how threatening that is to all of the foundations of things? And it almost immediately makes, puts enmity between those who are actually following him and the one that's trying to control. And what's amazing is this seems like this, and not to say that the intent of the person that wanted to be the pastor, but what's happening is it seems like the structures of man's creation wants to regulate. And it looks like Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm not a God of regulation. I'm a God of freedom. And I think one of the things that's amazing is I've been so frustrated by that. And I think a lot of people have been frustrated with whatever local church or whatever thing they got experienced was that it didn't match up. And it felt like it didn't feel like freedom. It didn't feel like abundance and joy. It felt like I am not doing the right thing to fit in here. And that's not what Jesus is saying at all. It's just, 
Well, think about what Jesus, how Jesus described himself and then how we, inter- we are taught to interpret that. He said that I don't go except as my father sends me. I don't work unless I see my father working. I don't speak unless my father commands me to speak. I don't teach except what my father gives me to teach. I do nothing, not one thing apart from my father. Now, you know what we are, we are trained to think that that sounds like? Slavery. Being enslaved. Yeah. Oh, man, you're so bound up. You're so slave. Well, no, because Paul makes this little statement that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Well, Jesus, what does freedom look like to you? What does it look, look look like to you to be free, to be a free man? Yeah. Steve, it's having the ability to please my father. That's what it is to be free. And what's our definition? Is going our own way. Just doing whatever we want, when we want, how we want. Well, when you make that to your rule. Yeah. If I'm going to rule with you, how am I free How am I liberated in my rule? You're able to please the Father in your rule with him. And and that's according to how it was created. You know, it's amazing, too. You think now about sovereignty and you think about freedom, you think about political, you think about the things that we're involved in. And it, it now makes it so clear that what you're constantly being offered is things that, are you trying to gather power yourself to go your own way? And what's interesting is I think back to kind of the original founding, right? And, you know, a lot of people want to say, well, so-and-so wasn't a Christian or they were a theist and all this kind of stuff. And this breaks down all those barriers. And yeah. it basically what's really interesting is one of the phrases that always rings in my ear is um, when a man is ruled from within, he doesn't have to be ruled from without, meaning the state. And one of the things that was at the foundation of the birth of America was this idea that these things are self-evident, that our rights come from a creator, and that the creator has given us these attributes. And these are self-evident. These are inalienable. You can't be taken away. They're given by the creator. And what's amazing about that as it relates to the civil society is it's actually the kingdom coming and the building of the kingdom is those who seek to do what the Father says and to stay connected to. The more people that do this, this is a transformation of society. And I look at the origins of this stuff of why a lot of people came to America and why a lot of people came out of this. And they built a foundation to say, hold on a second, this isn't an anarchy. This isn't a place to go your own way. This is actually a place in which we are embracing the internal tether, which is obedience to every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. And I think the origin of this was based on that core, is to say, what would it look like if there was a place where people actually did their very best to consider others in addition to themselves, right? To love God and to love others. And what would that look like if we were connected to the vine and obedient to that? You've you said it many times to me. How would you animate a system of government? How would you animate a system of finance? How would you animate a system of laws? How would you animate a system of security? Steve, this has been really amazing. That is that is fundamental, Matt. And I'll and I'll leave you, and I'll leave you maybe with this, unless we end up in another <laughs> three hours. Who who knows what's going to happen? But do you know that in the kingdom of God, there's no such word as obedience. There's no such word. Can you can you imagine, folks, in in heaven and stand, you know, standing before the Father's throne and him having to tell them to obey him? No. 
There is no such word. There's no concept of obedience. There is just a partnership, a living together. It is the with word. Yeah. With is so much more powerful because you're right. Obedience is basically... It's a subjection word. Yeah, it's a subjection word. That's exactly right. It's You're subject to me. I am ruling. I'm an authoritarian over you. And what you're saying is no. When you see yourself as a son, and now we come back to the the prodigal son. Yeah. He just was like, maybe my, my father will take me back as a slave. And it's like, no, no. He comes out and he puts a ring on you. You know, you are to rule with him. You are a descendant. You are a son. And that's, you know, when you say we've forgotten who we are, yeah. It's it, and it's so easy to fall back into it, but this stuff is so it's so enlightening too, in the sense that you're like, hold on a second, there's a whole different way of living. Because if I were to summarize this this whole thing, it's be able to identify, and Jesus will help you identify what the offers are of you going your own way. It's constantly like literally crouching at the door. Like it is constantly being offered up to us in this idea that, hold on, these are offers that we do not have to accept. No, no, we do not give them standing. Can you imagine for a minute if Biden's cabinet all of a sudden got together and said, hey, guys, we've, we've got some pretty, some pretty stuff, tough stuff going on. Uh, why don't we try something different by asking Jesus if he has an idea of how to deal with this? Well, and it's like you wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't be caught dead doing that because they were worried what people would think of them. They're not interested. No. They're just some, no, I don't want to do that. I want to make the decision. Well, I don't and want if you, to be a ruler. And if you I think that you're lower than the angels, you're like, well, I don't really have any power anyway. And it's like, it's like this self fulfilling prophecy. And obviously, the, you know, Satan's really crafty, man. He's very crafty. Really. So now we get to, to, to the Fed. What would happen if they did that? What if they got together and said, man, this thing is in, a, is in a mess. Wonder if Jesus has any ideas about how to turn this, you know, our financial system around. Do you, th- do you think we might give him a shot at giving some input on this one? Yeah. Or how about a family that's in trouble? Or how a business a farm, a school system, you name it. It is so practical, Matt. It's something you can step out from this from this stream and just simply say, Jesus, I have no clue what these guys are talking about. I'd like to know about it. Can you teach me how this how this thing works? I'm interested. Well, and it's it doesn't come with any baggage. No. There's no like, you know, it's amazing is I was just thinking of this dollar bill on the back. It says, in God we trust. Yeah. And, you know, you think about what, that's actually that motto was, you know, I think 1958. It wasn't from the beginning. And it's really interesting because it really says something really, you know, surprising about us is that this foundation Because the answer to all of this, he has the answers to these things. And here we are claiming a form of godliness, but denying its power. Wow. Steve? Did we get your transaction question? Yes, sir, we did. And of course, it just, it, it invites even more questions. But I think the thing that I would say is, Even though it's complex and it's a lot of words and it goes for two hours, the outcome is so simple. And it's a reminder that the yoke is easy and the burden is light. And that if you decide to go on this journey with him, that it's not to grind you into powder. It will refine you, but it is also one that is it resonates as good. And to me, I've always come back to the fact that what is the product of these of all of this? I have peace in my heart. It's just like there's a currency of peace and you go pretty much in any, any and every situation. And it's, it's, this has influenced my daily practice when I go home to the family. It's like, I literally go before I walk in, I'm like, all right, Jesus, please instruct me, you know? And, you know, and then you think about, you know, our responsibilities in what he's entrusted to us, right? Stewardship. So, 
There's a lot here, Steve, and I thank you so much for doing this again. You bet. Ep episode number seven. Anything else you want to share before we go? Nah, let's just go learn to hit the hit the curveball. Hit the curveball. Folks, thanks for joining in this. Steve, thank you once again for joining the Pulse today and doing this again. And I'm just so excited about the fruit that comes from this. So many people have ex expressed this desire to just that this has been helpful in this conversation. It's certainly a different format than I've ever experienced of just having a conversation in public. Um, are you comfortable? I think two sessions ago or last session, you offered a paper. Is there a, any resource or anything? I know that you had, you had been willing to share your email. Um, are you okay if I share your email again? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So if you want to reach out to, to Steve, it's srstags at aol.com. Boy, you are old school with that AOL, man. An old dude. <laughs> old school, man. And happy birthday tomorrow. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. May, May, May 6th. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Willie Mays. You and Willie Mays. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, folks, I think, Steve, you'll obviously, you know, send people stuff based on what they, they need. But if... Um, there's a number of things that Steve has written that you won't be able to find out there on the interwebs. And we're going to hopefully solve that. But at this point in time, if you want to, you know, you got a question for Steve or you just want to, um, you know, ask him, I think there's, there's, I was really amazed by the 1960s white paper, which encompasses so much of this, but there's so many things that Steve has written. And obviously um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about, this process in, in, in what we've been talking about. Um, reach out to Steve at, at srstags at aol.com. Um, Steve, thank you for being, um, for serving me in this way and, you know, in turn serving so many others, because this is going to exist, you know, on the interwebs. We'll see how long. Yeah. Good so, day. all right. Well, thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. you as well. Thanks. Bye. All right, folks, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Isn't it so amazing? You know, what's so neat about it? I'm just so curious about these things. And, and there's real fruit that's come from this. There's real, I've experienced, um, you know, this stuff isn't like a, a phony philosophy, right? This is the very core and construct of how this was made. And to think that we all have access, right? Steve is not like some guru, Right. He's not some theologian. He's a guy who said, you know what? And I love it. When he was six years old, the pastor said, Hey, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. And he was like, Yeah, where's this guy? Let's, let's, let's meet him. And he's doing the exact same thing for you and me. Hey, I want to introduce you to this guy. I talk to him all the time. And to think that we can ask him, you know, and he said, like a little baby, babies don't know English, right? Well, in some cases, I don't know how to listen to them. And many people have asked me this question. They're like, well, how do I discern this? And Steve said, hey, what's your intent? What do you desire? God knows your heart, right? Cain and Abel, he knew what that offering and what the intent of that was. What do you want? Ask him. He's a father. And so, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by how deep this well goes because it's never ending. But on the other hand, I'm amazed how simple it is as well. Because when you realize, hey, I don't want to do anything apart from you. And then think about the journey and the adventure that that, that entails. And imagine if there were more and more people who do the same thing. What is the impact of that? And so when I think about my you know, calling, God has said to me years and years ago, I want you to unlock global generosity by giving. And then feeding the 5,000. I'm like, all right. Well, you needed me to understand this stuff because I wouldn't have the right context of what giving really was because I think I was giving out of my going my own way. The gifts I wanted to give were for me rather than the gifts are the ones that you told me to give. Does that make sense? And that's a big deal. And it changes the whole nature of like, we're not changing the world. We want to be a part of what he's doing. He's changing the world. And the greatest joy is actually doing it with him, not on our own. And so many of us have, in a way, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others in addition to yourself. Well, wow, let's do that. What would that look like? But in a way, now I'm recognizing the fact that I got, I got nothing apart from what he tells me to do. 
And I'll be honest with you, I, I mean, it's not like I hear the audible voice of God saying, Matt, go do this. But sometimes I have, and I don't mean audibly, but like it is clear, this is what you're supposed to do. And most times I say, I don't want to do that. But then I do. And then I see just um, unbelievable, I see miracles. And I think there are so many people who are looking for those type of miracles. And, you know, so in summary, many, many offers are going to be made to you. And so that next time where sin is creeping at the door, what is that thing? It's an offer. You don't have to accept it. It's common to man. You can stand up underneath it. He will show you a way out. And that's just the part of the journey, part of the discipline, of crab walking, as Steve would say. Folks, thanks for joining The Pulse today. Episode number seven with Steve Staggs, Right Side Up. Folks, what if we saw the world right side up? Boy, I'll tell you what, this is a, a massive, massive blessing for me. And after 20 years of trying to do this stuff, is to come into something so new and so fresh and so simple. So blessings to you, folks. Have a great weekend. Um, we just had the uh, lunar eclipse, folks. Maybe the pulse chain's going to launch. Everything is getting good. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. Take care of yourself and others, and do not mess with Texas. Take care, everybody.